The assignment that I have from the Lord this morning, this word is what I like to call weighty. And, you know, there's some words that can be weightier than others. I've been feeling it all weekend in high expectation for God to do some great things. And I believe that there's certain topics and certain words that you preach on that shift atmospheres. And today is one of those topics. Acts chapter 4 and verse 29. Acts chapter 4 and verse 29 is where we'll start. In the New King James Version, it says this. Now, Lord, look on their threats. And they had the Roman government threatening them, trying to shut down the first church, saying you can't preach about this Jesus Christ. And grant to your servants that with all boldness, they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Say boldness. boldness. Turn to your neighbor and say, be bold. Turn your other neighbor, the good-looking one, say, be bold. be bold. Be bold. Now, how would you like it if I or Dr. Winston, he was preaching the Word of God, and he got so powerful, the Spirit started moving that the whole place started shaking? I mean, that's, that, that's a lot of power right there. And, you know, as I was looking at just, you know, the first church, looking at the apostles and then looking backward toward the Old Testament, looking at the prophets, they had some things in common, but I believe one of the major things they had in common was a healthy fear of the Lord. They feared the Lord greatly. They didn't fear men, they feared God. And I believe that in this season, God is restoring the backbone to the church. He's restoring boldness. And we preach about revival, but revival takes boldness. And I believe that there's been a strategic demonic agenda to separate people from the power of God by encouraging them not to fear God, especially for our young generations. I'm talking to you millennials, Gen Z, even Gen Alpha, you can get this too, that there's been a specific agenda to try to water down a good, conscious fear of the Lord to try to get people to participate in the works of the flesh. But what it does is it tries to slowly sap the power out of the church, out of a believer's life. Now, I know that that's not you and that's not us, but that's what the enemy has tried to do, but praise God that we always triumph through Jesus Christ. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13 in the New Living Translation, it says this. Here now is my final conclusion. Fear God and obey his commands. For this is everyone's duty. No matter who you are, where you're from, what your background is like, the title you have or don't have, money you have in your account or generation that you associate with, doesn't matter. Everyone is required to fear God. When you look at the children of Israel, how they were enslaved for 400 years, and then God sent a man named Moses, a deliverer, to get them out of slavery, and he starts sending plagues upon Egypt to try to loosen Pharaoh's grasp. And the Bible says five times that God spoke to Moses and told Moses, say to Pharaoh, let my people go. But interestingly enough, he didn't say, tell Pharaoh, let my people go so they can go into the promised land. Exodus chapter 7 and verse 16, it hints at something that actually is echoed through the five occasions. And you shall say to him, the Lord God of the Hebrews has sent me to you saying, let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. See, God didn't tell Moses to tell Pharaoh, let them go so they can go to the promised land. He said, let them go so they can worship me. Let them go so they can get reacclimated with me so I can reintroduce myself to them. 
Because after 400 years, they forgot who I was. They don't know who I am. They're not putting any respect on my name anymore. So let me reintroduce myself. So he said, tell Pharaoh, let them go. So they get into the wilderness, and they murmuring, they complaining. They still trying to figure it out. He brings Moses at the top of Mount Sinai and starts giving him what we call the commandments, over three, or excuse me, over 600 commandments, I believe it's 633 commandments, but he talks about in Exodus chapter 20, the first 10, which a lot of us are familiar with. And notice the first three, the very first one, it talks about you shall not serve any other God. You shall not worship any other God before me. The first one. The second one says, you shall not make any graven or carved image or idol and worship it because I am a jealous God. Then the third one says, you will not treat my name regular. Says, do not take my name in vain. The first three commandments all talked about having a fear of the Lord. Understanding that Jehovah God, Yahweh, is different than all these other gods that you done heard about. And as this was happening, there's, they hear thunder, they see lightning, they see the smoke, they got scurred. And so in verse 20, let's go to verse 20 of Exodus chapter 20. Moses says, don't be afraid. And he answered them, for God has come in this way to test you so that your fear of him will keep you from what? Come on, say it loud. Your fear of him will keep you from sinning. To understand how to worship God and fear God will keep you from living a sinful lifestyle that is not pleasing to him. Do I have some believers here today? So God had to teach them how to respect him and reverence him alone. Leviticus chapter 10, verse 3, it says this, by those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. If you're going to come near God and be intimate with God, you must regard him as holy. But I know in 21st century Western Christianity, praise God for this, we preach on the love of God and thank God for his love. He's been better than good to us. And through his grace and mercy, that's the only way we could know him through the person of Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins and is our last high priest, our Savior forever. But what if in our attempt to make God approachable, as a byproduct, people have become very casual with the Lord? Casual with their lifestyle. Casual with sin. And God is a merciful God, but don't let mercy make you forget about accountability. Don't let, let grace make you forget about holiness. We got to understand that we have to have a healthy reverence for the Lord. So I want to minister to you in the next 36 minutes, I'll round up 37, from the subject titled, Living in the Fear of the Lord living in the fear of the Lord. We are told through scriptures approximately 300 times to have a fear of the Lord. Over and over and over. And when I talk about fear of the Lord, I'm not talking about wrath. I'm not talking about worry or anxiety or dread or terror due to some impending judgment. No, no, I'm not talking about that. And we'll go through some definitions in just a moment. But let's go to a scripture, Acts chapter 9 and verse 31. I don't want you to get, your, get the wrong impression of fear of the Lord. In the first church, this is what it said. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. That sounds good. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. Now, that seems kind of strange because, you know, the, the carnal mind interprets fear as something, you know, worry and, and dread and tear. And so here you got the fear of the Lord being mentioned with the comfort of the Holy Ghost. And it said that they had peace. 
So when we're talking about this fear of the Lord, we must not be talking about something that's a negative thing, but yet something that's accompanied with comfort. See, I believe the love of God and the fear of God are meant to complement each other. Let me tell you a story. There was a, a guy who was a popular preacher in the 1980s. And when I say popular, he was one of the most well-known preachers worldwide. Had a mega ministry, fiery preacher. And unfortunately, he was convicted of mail fraud, accounting fraud, wire fraud. He committed adultery against his wife. And there was some things, some sin that was hidden and covered up that got revealed. And so he got sentenced to five years in prison. And he said, prison wasn't God's judgment. It was his mercy. And when he was asked, well, when did you stop loving Jesus? When did you fall out of love with Jesus? He said, I didn't. And I said, no, 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 no we, we understand what you're saying, but come on. I mean, you were, you were doing some things you knew was wrong. You were living in sin. You had this adulterous relationship going on for years. Come on now. I mean, like, when did you stop loving Jesus? And he said, I did it. I still love Jesus. Even through it, I still love Jesus. But I didn't fear God. And he said, my concern is that there are millions of Americans just like me that love Jesus but have no fear of God. And I started looking at the scriptures and I was reminded of how Satan, who was once Lucifer, who resided in heaven, in God's very presence, along with a third of the angels, he was in charge of worshiping God, creating that atmosphere. He, he could have been like a, a worship leader, a praise and worship leader in our days. And he had this proximity to God, but yet because he lost his reverence for God, he got kicked out of heaven. He was in God's presence, but got too familiar with God. And because he got prideful, he got dismissed from his assignment. That tells me that you can be in church, but not have any fear of God that's preached at the church. You can even work in a ministry, but have no fear of God in the ministry that you're supposed to reverence that God. Now, this isn't an, isn't an indictment or an attack on anybody, but we have to understand that we have to have a healthy fear of God. This fear of God, let's define it. It means to be in awe of him to honor him, to revere him, to esteem and respect him, to value him, to adore him more than anything or anyone else. It means to tremble at his very presence. Now, I know what you might be saying online. You may be saying, well, Pastor David, doesn't God take away fear? Well, as a matter of fact, he does. Let's look at the scripture. Let's get some degree of clarity in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Now, this fear isn't talking about the fear of God. This is talking about a sensual a carnal, temporal, uh, uh, demonically inspired fear. So when we talk about that kind of fear, it's a tormenting fear. It's a bad fear that tries to drive people away. You know, when people get afraid, they'll run, right? So that's a result of that fear. But when we talk about a holy fear, a holy fear draws people in and it endures us to God or endears us, excuse me, it endears us to God. It draws us in, it pulls us in. So that holy fear is what we want. In Psalms chapter 89 and verse 7, it says this, God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of Living Word Christian Center. God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints. 
and to be held in reverence by all those around him. So we are to reverence God, not just in church, but out of church. Not just on Sunday, in our Sunday go to meet and close, but on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday when that girl is getting on your last nerve, and Friday when maybe you and your spouse are having in a uh, disagreement, and then on Saturday maybe when you're tempted to do something that you shouldn't do and go out to that party that you have no business being at. We are to reverence God in everything we do. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, it says this. This is a prophetic word coming about the coming Messiah. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Jesus operated in all seven of these spirits. And if Jesus operated in this fear of the Lord, we should want to operate in the same spirit of the fear of the Lord. Let's go to part one. That was my nice long introduction. We'll speed up a little bit. Part one, understanding the fear of the Lord. Understanding the fear of the Lord. Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 13. Turn with me. It says, the fear of the Lord is to what? Hate. Say it loud. Hate. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance and the evil way. Let me stop. I just feel the Holy Ghost. When people who are trying to do bad things to you get something bad, you should not say, good, they got what they deserve. Because if evil was done to them, the fear of the Lord hates evil. We don't want evil done to them. We want them to turn from their wicked ways and receive Jesus to come to the Lord. I felt like that was for somebody. But the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. I like what our pastor says. The fear of the Lord is to love what God loves and hate what he hates. You should write that down. The fear of the Lord is to hate what God hates, love what he loves. Love what God loves, hate what he hates. That's real simple, right? You can just line up and line it up in your life. Say, does God love this? Okay, I love this. Does God hate this? Okay, I, like, I hate this. Well, if God doesn't love it, I shouldn't tolerate it. God loves sinners, but hates sin. But yet he can separate what people are doing from who a person is. Interesting. The fear of God is more than just respecting him. I respect my neighbors. But yet the fear of God is a reverence for the divine commands he gives. It's a trepidation of offending him. It's a deep desire to please him through obedience. It's submitting to his discipline. It's worshiping him in awe. It's not to be afraid of the Lord. Now, for the unbeliever, the fear of God is something that is to be afraid of because it's a fear of judgment of God. It's a fear of eternal death, of eternal separation from God. But for us as believers, the fear of God is a reverence of God. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 28, it says this, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. And so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. We should seek to live in a way that pleases God in every area of our lives. That is how we reverence God. That is how we fear God. We can't say we fear God, but our lifestyles show no evidence or trace that we revere him and, and are, uh, are concerned about not offending him. Because we love what God loves and hate what he hates. See, I can explain it like this. On the left side, you have God's grace and mercy. And that covers us. But on the right side, you have God's judgment, God's justice, 
and you have the fear of the Lord. But notice both of these hands and arms extend from the same body. So on one side, you got you know, grace and mercy. On the other side, you got uh, judgment, justice, and the fear of the Lord, but extends from the same body. That body is love. And God's grace and mercy are an extension of that love the same way his judgment, his justice, and the fear of the Lord is still an extension of his love. The person of God did not change. Who God is did not change. But if you try to access the grace of God without understanding the fear of the Lord, you will actually have an imbalanced lifestyle. You'll have an imbalanced view of who God is. To have a healthy view of who God is, we can't just talk about grace and mercy without talking about a fear of reverence of the Lord. A.W. Tozer said this, when men no longer fear God, they transgress his laws without hesitation. (laughs) Psalms 19 verse 9 says this, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The fear of the Lord will help you live clean. It'll help you live right. A reverence for God in every area of our lives. And I believe that this love of God is exemplified by his boundaries that he sets. Let's take a fish. You have a fish in a lake. You have a fish in Lake Michigan. And what if one day one of those fish said, I just want to be free, and jumps up on the shoreline on the beach, just hops himself up there, and says, I want to be free, and starts hopping on the beach, trying to get himself up to Lakeshore Drive. Now this fish, pretty soon, is going to do what? Die. Because he's brought himself into an environment where he wasn't meant to exist. And so God created the fish to live in the water and has set up a healthy boundary called the shoreline to ensure that that fish could stay in the environment where he can not only live but thrive. And now God shows his love and he shows his care and concern by setting up that boundary. But what happens is, if the fish interprets that boundary as something that God is trying to keep me away from the fun that everybody else is having, having, and then hops his happy self up on the shoreline, that fish has separated himself from the very environment that was its life source. So God shows his love by extending boundaries, not taking them away. And you think you're missing out on something. Let me tell you, God is trying to save you by creating that boundary. God is trying to save you by separating you from that girlfriend or that boyfriend. God is trying to save you from delivering you in that environment. God is trying to save you by helping you understand that you shouldn't be doing these drugs. God is trying to save you from living that sinful lifestyle. Man, these girls talking about I got a girlfriend. No, 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 no. Hold on. We can't think that freedom is the, legitimizes any choice we make. The Apostle Paul says we have this freedom in Christ, but don't let this freedom give you an excuse or a reason to sin. Because God still hates sin. And if we fear the Lord, we will hate sin too. And our lifestyles will reflect it. (laughs) Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 27. I'm telling you, the fear of the Lord... That'll help clean you up. That'll help clean you up. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life that one may turn away from the snares of death. Notice, it said the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. It didn't say the fear of the Lord is separating you from life. It's the fear of the Lord is life-giving to be able to turn you away from things that cause death. And the fear of the Lord comes before the rewards from the Lord, I believe. Let's do the progression. One man calls it this this divine progression, this divine trilogy. We have the fear of the Lord, 
and then we have faith in God, then we have the favor from God. Fear of God, faith in God, favor from God in that progression. And see, if we skip the fear of God and just go to faith in God to try to get the favor of God, what happens is we start treating God like a genie. We start worshiping when it's convenient. We start living this life that is just like, oh, God is here to get me what I want. Instead of, no, 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 God is holy. I am here to do what God wants. And as God has told me what to do, then I use my faith to get what he has for me. But I can't skip the steps of the fear of God because the fear of God empowers my faith in God to get from God what God has laid up in store for me. The fear of God is where it starts. Let me, let me just do something real quick. I, I don't know if I gave you the scripture in the back. Psalms chapter 112, verse 3. Because we went over this scripture when I taught a few weeks ago about planting season. Wealth and riches will be in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Wealth and riches, they're in my house. Praise God. I've declared this over myself a thousand times. That's a great scripture to lock our faith on. But notice, go to verse 1. Let's see where we start. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who what? Say it loud. We can't skip steps. I can't get to wealth and riches are in my house if I don't fear the Lord first. If I don't acknowledge God's sovereignty in my life first. If I'm not having adoration for him first. If I'm not honoring him first, loving what he loves, hating what he hates, I can't get to wealth and riches are in my house. My life has to be a reflection of a fear of the Lord, that I won't serve money, I don't serve other things, I won't bow to cancel culture, I serve God, and Him alone will I fear. Now, part two mismanaging the power. Praise God. Part number two, mismanaging the power. I'll speed up just a little bit. Mm. The fear of God is connected to the power of God. And it's like electricity. Let me do an illustration, an example for you. Y'all know I like the illustrations. Thank you, sir. This is an electrical socket, an American electrical socket if you're tuning in from a different country. <laughs> and so electricity is interesting because it'll either help you or harm you based on how you use it, based on how you access it. Back when I was a young lad in fifth grade, I had this friend named Dale, and Dale was really adventurous. I mean, he liked to build his own ramps, to jump his dirt bike off, and all kind of stuff. And he'd be like, okay, hey, let's, let's, David, let's go do this. Uh, okay. And then he built this thing like three feet high. I was like, no thanks. I'll watch you. Anyways, so Dale, who was adventurous, a little bit mischievous at times, had a lot of energy. He got kicked out of class one day. We are in fifth grade. Got kicked out of class one day. Teacher said, go sit in the hallway. Now, I don't know if they do that anymore. I know things are different. But he got kicked out into the hallway. So about five minutes later, I hear this loud buzz, and I was sitting next to the door of the classroom. I hear this loud buzz, and I see Dale's body hovering over the floor and shoot past the doorway. <laughs> and I, I said, uh, teacher, I, I, I think Dale might need some help. <laughs> you might want to see if he's okay. So they checked on him. Fortunately, he was okay. What they found was Dale had taken the paper clip, and he had stuck it in the socket. See, Dale was trying to access the power the wrong way. And the fear of the Lord and the power of God is like electricity. It'll help you if you access it the right way. You can plug in your smartphone, you can plug in a lamp and light, 
You can plug in your curling iron so you can get your do right. It's a great benefit. But you got to be careful of electricity because there's a power to it. But you don't have to be scared of the electricity. Because when you manage it correctly, there's nothing to fear. Let's go to a scripture. Ananias and Sapphira. And Acts chapter 5, verse 1. Let me give you a little bit of background. So the first church, the apostles, and those who were gathered together, they were bringing everything that they had, all their possessions, all their goods. They were pooling it together to make sure nobody was without, nobody had lack. They were selling plots of land, bringing the proceeds to the first church. It was a great thing. This man named Joseph, he sold uh, property for a large amount of money. He came, brought it before the disciples' feet, and they were so encouraged that they actually gave him a nickname because of this big gift. He would be like a big giver in our context. And so they were so encouraged that they changed his name to Barnabas, which meant son of encouragement. And so this was a great thing. They were celebrating what God had done, and he brought all the proceeds of this sale, laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, Ananias and Sapphira, they saw this. And they saw the recognition that he was getting. Maybe he was starting to be known as a big giver in the first church. Maybe they saw that he was getting a little celebrity, as we would say. And so they saw this, and they wanted that too. They wanted this prestige. Maybe they wanted some nickname. They wanted to be known. So what happens? We pick up in verse 1, Acts chapter 5 in the NIV. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife, Sapphira, sold a piece of property... And with his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to a human or human beings, but to God. So let me help you understand. They sold their part of property. They brought the proceeds, but then told them and acted like this was the full proceed, just like Barnabas did. But they had kept back part of it. And Peter was saying, well, it was yours to keep anyway. You didn't have to do this. You could have kept it and then brought your gift, and that would have been fine. But instead, you tried to play it off and pretend like you brought the whole thing, that you were a big giver. And when Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. Now, this is New Testament, New Covenant. Jesus had gone to the cross, went to the grave, resurrected, ascended, all that was done. They had the Holy Ghost at this point. They were good. We're moving forward. But yet, New Covenant, New Testament, they died. Ananias died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in. Uh oh not knowing what had happened. Now, Peter, he, he tried. He, he gave her a chance. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said. Oh, yeah, that's the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in, finding her dead, carried her out, and buried her beside her husband. <laughs> and on cue, great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these servants. They decided to mishandle the power of God by not having the fear of God. They lost their reverence for God, and as a result, they lost their lives. The same power that was healing people 
and doing great things in the chapter before now left them lifeless because they decided to lie to the Holy Spirit. But there was some good news because if you look at the next verse, verse 12, let's look at the next verse. After all that happened, the apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used to meet together in, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop right there. Go to verse 15. And so we see great signs and wonders. And then as a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. And it says all of them were healed. Notice great fear sees the church, but notice great signs and wonders and miracles followed after an understanding of a healthy fear of the Lord. See, a healthy reverence and respect and fear of the Lord will actually lead to a display of the power of God. <laughs> Write it down. Reverence for God leads to a display of the power of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1, we see the Apostle Paul, he wrote, who was the grace specialist, might I add, he wrote more about grace than anybody else, in the Bible, and it says this, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So notice, the fear of God is not there to make you scared. The fear of God is there to clean you up. <laughs> it says that he's perfecting holiness in the fear of God. See, the fear of the Lord is something that should be active in our lives and points us toward holiness. The fear of God is a safeguard against abusing grace. <laughs> Write this down if you're writing notes. Wherever there or whenever there is a lack of the fear of the Lord, there is an increase in carnality and immorality. Whenever there is a lack of the fear of the Lord, there is an increase in carnality and immorality. Which brings me to my last part. Part three, the consequence of reverence. The consequence of reverence. Now, consequence doesn't necessarily mean something bad. I actually have some good news here for you that when you fear the Lord, you get the result of what submitting to God brings. Let's go to Psalms chapter 128 and verse 1. And the ESV, it says this, Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. Well, that's good news because fear in the Lord brings blessing. Fear of the Lord brings intimacy with him. Psalms chapter 25 and verse 14. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him. If you want to feel closer to God, you want to get closer to God, more intimate with him, fear the Lord. Reverence him in everything that you do. Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 4, it says this, the reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. Psalms chapter 111, verse 10, it says this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you don't know what to do, reverence God in everything you do, and that will start the process so you can know what to do. You can discern the wisdom of God. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 26, it says, In the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence. See, the fear of the Lord will help drive out insecurity and timidity. The fear of the Lord is how you have confidence. Because if you know of God before you, no one can stand against you. And you know when you fear God, you're on the right team. You're on the winning team. You're on God's side. Psalms chapter 114 and verse 111. It says, the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him. So we please the Lord when we fear him. And one more bonus scripture, Psalms chapter 29 and verse 25, it cautions us. The fear of man brings a snare, but he who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. Come on, he'll be safe. You know what snare means? That means trap. And when you fear man, it brings a trap. And that's what culture tries to do. That's what social media tries to do. The enemy, like what Pastor said one time, the enemy tries to use social media as a guard dog to try to keep you timid and not bold, speaking up for faith, truth, justice, and righteousness. 
See, cancel culture will be a trap to try to make you be timid and not bold for Jesus. And I know we're in a sensitive time. We're in a sensitive place in history and in culture. We're even in election season. But my question to you is, will you let the fear of God inform your values? Will you let the fear of God inform how you live and how you act? Will you let the fear of God regulate what you value and how you vote? I'm not talking about a right or left side, a Republican, Democrat, or Independent. I'm not talking about any of that because his kingdom rules over all. There is no right or left side in heaven. God is above that. He is not a, a, politi- a political God. He, that, that is something that we created. But God says, I'm bigger than your politics. But God is here to inform us of how we do it so his values can be articulated in our culture. So his values can be shown in our land. And when the fear of the Lord is not there, people think that they can do anything. When we're not there advocating for the fear of the Lord, the power and presence of God, or reverence for God, people think they can do anything. People can think they can bring their own new doctrine into a church. People think they can come on the front lawn of the White House and do any kind of stuff and and parade naked and, and... You know what really gets me? Me and my wife have four kids all together. And to tell a child that they can have mutilated body parts, they can do things that are permanent in their body without a parental consent, that is demonic and wicked. Hey, if somebody gets to the age of consent, they can decide to do what they want to do. But to try to manipulate a child intentionally to do something that is permanent, can have psychological ramifications for the rest of their lives. And these are children. And you and me have been given authority. We can't let things that are done to innocent people, we can't let that be pervasive in culture. We have to stand up. We have to stand up for those who can't defend themselves. It says, do justice to the poor and needy. We have to protect our children. We have to stand up for righteousness and justice. We have to love what God loves and hate what he hates. I'm not not here against people. I know people have their different views. I'm not here against people. There's a demonic system that has been strategically set up and people don't know what they're doing is wrong. The Bible says the God of this age has blinded the minds. It tried to blind the minds of them who see it to the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. But I do know this. When the fear of the Lord is not present, people get timid. And wickedness becomes pervasive. Winston Churchill said it well. The power of the wicked is always enhanced by the timidity and indecision of the righteous. Daniel chapter 3, I think, gives us a good biblical discourse as I bring this to a close. Daniel chapter 3 talks about three Hebrew boys, government officials, if we will. Senators, I don't know, politicians, maybe the House of Representatives. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They worked in government. And yet, the king had a good idea. Nebuchadnezzar said, let's erect this image. And when the sound is played, everybody bow down and worship this image. And the three Hebrew boys said, nah, we ain't doing that. We only worship the Lord our God. Jehovah God, Yahweh, the one true God. And so it was told to the king. The king said, I'm going to give you another chance. You, you bow down. They said, king, let us tell you. We're not trying to disrespect. We mean no disrespect, but we're not bowing down. And he said, fine, so be it. Throw them into the furnace. Heat it up seven times hotter. And throw them in. So they got thrown in. And then what happened next? 
If you see in verse 25, at the time where they should have been yelling and, and screaming and their clothes are burning up and they're catching on fire, he didn't see any of that. As a matter of fact, he said, wait a minute. Look, I see four men loose. Did we, did, did we throw three in there? I see four men loose and they're not even hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the son of God. Now, I don't know how he knew what Jesus looked like, but yet he had a quickening that he said, wait a minute, this is like the Son of God. I threw them in there to punish them because they wouldn't worship, but because they didn't worship and decided to worship their God, notice that Jesus showed up. Notice that when I stand for righteousness, when I stand for justice, when I fear God, God shows up on the scene. When I fear God, he comes through to deliver. When I fear God, I don't have to fear man because when I stand up for him, he's going to come through. And so they're burning their fuel and they're burning this gas and they said, okay, enough with that. Turn it off. Bring him out. They came out, weren't even smelling like smoke. He said, what in the world is going on here? I like what Charles Spurgeon says. He who fears God has nothing else to fear. I said, he who fears God has nothing else to fear. Because when you fear God, you don't have anything else to fear. But here's what I've noticed. When you don't fear God, you're open to fear everything else. And then in verse 28 of Daniel chapter 3, <laughs> say, no fear here. No fear. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Wait a minute. Notice what we see another time. We see once a fear of the Lord is displayed, a worship happens. This heathen king decided to bless the Lord God because somebody was bold enough to say, I won't worship you, even if you try to cancel me. He said, blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own. See, that's what the enemy's after. He's after worship. Worship can be defined as whatever gets your attention, your affection, and allegiance. Maybe we should take inventory for a second. Verse 29, you can put it back up. Therefore, I make a decree that any people in any nation or language which speaks anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made an ash heap, because there is no other God who can deliver like this. I'm here to tell you, when you stand up for God, God will stand with you. When you have a fear of God, God will deliver you. And when other people see God deliver you, they'll want to worship your God. God is glorified when you are bold. I say God is glorified when you are bold. See, the fear of God is the highway to revival. And when we have a healthy fear of God, we'll see God break out in our services, break out on school campuses, break out in our neighborhoods, break out at practices, break out in our places of work, break out, break out in anywhere we are. When we have the fear of God, the presence of God comes with it. The fear of God brings the power of God. And it will turn people from dead works to serving a good God. Come on, that's a good place to give God a praise. That's a good place to worship him. I'm talking about the God of the universe. I'm talking about Yahweh, the omnipotent, 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 omnipresent God of the universe. Come on, let's all stand to our feet and let's worship God.
Let's worship God. Come on, receive the word of the Lord. You're not doing it for me, but if you're still sitting, maybe you need to meditate on this. Because if you're sitting down, maybe you don't have quite a revelation of what it means to acknowledge God's presence. Maybe that's the reason why you're still in a place that you're in. Maybe you're trying to figure out, why am I being delayed? Why am I being pushed? Why am I being stifled? Why am I struggling? If you have a healthy fear of God, then I can tell you this, that the power of God shows up. But when we're casual with God, that doesn't get it. When we're casual with worship, that doesn't get it. When we're casual with, with praise and worship, that doesn't get it. When we try to put God on our agenda and our timeline and box him in to just when we have time for him, that doesn't get it. We want to live a lifestyle of worship. That word worship in the Hebrew, it actually means to bow down, to kneel. It means to kiss. Worship is intimate. Worship is some, isn't something that's passive. And that's what it means to fear the Lord, to have a reverent respect for him. And I want to say this before we call for souls. It's the most important sensitive time of the whole message. It's calling for salvation. But when I leave and walk out during that time, I have made a declaration that I've come to church for convenience, but I don't really value what God values. Because if I value what God values, he values souls. He values people's lives. The Bible says when one person comes to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, all of heaven rejoices. It didn't say all of heaven walks out so they can get out of the parking lot quicker than everybody else. I'm not here to sound harsh. We got to tighten up. If we want to see revival break out, we got to tighten up. We can't be casual about Christianity. We have to worship him for who he is. And if he says, son, daughter, stop, pray, you stop and pray because somebody's life is in the balance. The best thing you can do is pray in the Holy Ghost. Because the enemy, he's trying to fight people so they won't be strong enough to give their lives to Jesus Christ. I say this in love, but I see what it takes. Because when there's a healthy reverence of God, oh my gosh, it seems like miraculous things always follow. These signs and wonders will follow them who believe. We want to get to those signs and wonders. We want to reverence his spirit. Heavenly Father, we reverence you in our lives and in this place. You are holy. and There's none like you. We love you, Lord. And we stand in awe of you. Your almighty presence and power. As you call us to repentance and you draw us in with your love through forgiveness. Lord, help us to say yes to you each and every day and every moment of our lives that you're always with us and that everything that we say and do, every way we live, let it be pleasing unto you. In Jesus' name, amen.